Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I'm joined with, uh, by Bob Wiesner. Bob, great to, uh, to have you here. Thank you, Michael. I'm delighted to be here. So Bob, for those who aren't familiar with you and your work, uh, you are the managing partner at the Artemis Partnership in the Americas, so Western Hem- Hemisphere, uh, and your firm helps organizations like Toyota, Deloitte, KPMG, Barclays, and a whole bunch of other very well-known brands uh, successfully sell complex solutions in competitive categories. Uh, and your latest book, which I thoroughly enjoyed, is called Winning is Better, shares the strategies and tactics uh, that have led to consistent success for many top performing companies. I want to dig in and, and kind of get right to the quote unquote meat, uh, because there's, there's so much to unpack uh, that you shared in your book. You talk about when going after new clients, uh, you, you call them pursuits, kind of that's I think how you, you reference, right? Uh, prospecting and engaging with clients. I want to understand from all of your experience, what, what have you seen is the big kind of difference or distinction between uh, clients or consultants who have a winning mindset uh, and, and the, their actions that come with that as well as their behaviors and the distinction between those who, who tend to struggle? Like what really separates a winning mindset and winning actions and winning behaviors from those who, who tend to, to not see the results that they would desire? Uh, it, it's a great question, Michael, and thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, there's a number of things that separate the winners from those who uh, come in second. Um, I had an old boss um, who used to react to firms that were very proud of, the, of their um, track record. Oh, we, we came in second. We're really close. And he would say, well, when you came in second, it means you're first of the losers. Uh, maybe not so much to be proud of. Um right. You know, the, differ- the difference among many explanations that we hear often from the decision makers themselves is that the winning uh, firms were more client centric. They were more focused on the, the wisdom and the insights and what's relevant and what matters to the client. Whereas the firms that don't win often are much more focused on their own capabilities, their own um, uh, strengths, if you will. Right. And consultants, I think, are, are classic examples of the how you can represent these two different sides of the coin and then have two different results. When you go into a consulting business, Michael, and, and, and I'm sure you and your listeners have been through this, the first things you sometimes think about is what do I want to consult in? What is what is my what are my solutions? What are, what what do I want to be doing? You know that's fine. You need to get there, but the winning firms start from the premise of what does the client need to hear? What do they need? What's what wisdom can I bring them that that would allow me to stand well against whatever competitors are. So I know I'm rambling a bit, but I want to emphasize this fact that winning requires a client focus. It does not require a a focus on your own capabilities, but it requires your insights and your wisdom that a client can say, yep, those guys get it. Right. I want to dive yeah, deeper into this topic as we continue our, our conversation. One of the other things that really stood out to me in the book, and this is something that you know, we do with, with clients as well, so it really resonated, is this that idea of not just focusing, um, or I should say that most consultants don't focus on, on ROI and, and profitability of their clients and their projects. They view any project as, as a good project or, or any client as being the same as any other client. And you kind of discussed... In, in the book, your example of uh, the power of going through this, this exercise. Can you just talk a little, about, a little bit about what you've seen in terms of maybe uh, organizations and, and firms who don't pay attention to the profitability and ROI of specific efforts, pursuits, as you call them, uh, or client engagements and, and kind of how that's played out for them, either good or bad? Yeah, um, this is um, something that can be very seductive for consultants. Um, and can lead them down very unfortunate paths. We as consultants have this desire to get our foot in the door. Um, We're looking for that first project with the idea being that if we can get a first project, maybe we have to cut our price. 
maybe we have to do something that's not the most exciting or the sexiest part of our business. But if we can get in there, we can grow the client. That has not worked out for enough companies often enough to justify it as a viable strategy mm. because for several reasons, first of all, and we've all seen this, when you go in at a low price, it's very hard to raise your price mm. um, at any point down the road. So you wind up operating without enough profit to reinvest in your business, to grow your business, to keep the lights on um, on a very practical basis. Secondly, when you go in, to take an opportunity that has been presented to you that's not a core part of, of the reason you're in business, sometimes you get pigeonholed into that um, it, as the firm that does that thing. In the right. book, I tell the, the true story of an architectural firm that was really eager to get an assignment from a large developer that would allow them to, to do what architects love to do, which is to design a whole new building. Um, that particular developer did not need at this particular time, a new building, but they needed bathrooms to be renovated in one of their current properties. They thought it was a foot in the door. So they raised their hand and said, sure, we can do the bathrooms. Um, they got the assignment. They did a wonderful job on bathrooms. And in the mind of that developer, they became known as the bathroom company. Mm -hmm. In the subsequent to that, whenever that developer had a new building that needed to be put up, that architectural firm did not really have an advantage mm -hmm. um, over other firms that the architect that the developer knew, who had done major buildings for um, in the past. So you've got to be very careful that your first exposure to um, a new client is is what we call strategically correct. Right. So you're doing the work that you want to do, that you really want to do. You're making the money that you really want to make. And the relationship that you're going to have with that client is going to be one that you're going to feel excited about, comfortable with, and be able to grow. Yeah. Um, what have you seen, you know, so oftentimes landing that larger initial engagement can be challenging for, for consultants, uh, especially if they don't have a, an existing relationship with that buyer. If let's say that they've gotten in with a discovery offer, so a lower price offer, it's, it, they're not discounting. So they're still doing work that they feel good about. It's still profitable for them, but it's not the, the, you know, the overall full engagement. What are some of the steps you've seen that, that can work well for them to go from just getting their foot in the door to, to now actually expanding? So if we maybe go back to the, arch, you know, the bathroom architecture example that you share, which I, I, I loved when I, when I read, kind of laughed at that uh, example, what could they have done to now that they do have their foot in the door to expand and not just be, continue being labeled as, as the bathroom architecture firm? If they want to capture more business and provide more value for that existing client, how should they go about it? That particular example, I think that that was flawed from the beginning because they shouldn't have gone in to take the bathroom job. Mm. They should have held out for something that would be more akin to a, a, a larger project that they really wanted. Right. The relevant part of your question, though, Michael, the really important part of your question is, is that other that first piece, which is if you take a, a, a job that's a smaller job than you normally would take, how do you grow that into a bigger job? And that's a really great question. Um, the way you do that is by having measurable outcomes associated with that job. So if I am for example, um, helping a client to develop a, um, a new business strategy, but they really don't need a complete new business strategy, but they have a certain part of their business that needs a little bit of help. Um, and instead of paying full price for one of our strategic solutions, they only have a fraction of the budget. Mm -hmm. I might be okay taking that. But what I want to do are two things. First, I want to make sure that the work we're going to do is representative of the work that we're capable of doing. In other words, it's not bathrooms, right. but it's actually new business strategy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I want to have measurable outcomes. And this is something that's very hard for a lot of consultants to actually get. But because I have measurables, something quantified, I now have something to talk about to those decision makers in that company 
besides just the fact that they like the work, I can point to outcomes. I can point to results that met goals or exceeded goals and led to some significant impact for that company. So it's the metrics that make the difference. So yeah, to interrupt and jump in, just to clarify. So the the outcomes that you're mentioning here or the the metrics, these would be agreed upon by both you as as the consultant and kind of strategist, as well as the client. So it's not just saying, here's what we do with our clients and just like, you know, checking that off. You're saying here, you know, what would be meaningful for you? What does success look like in these different areas? And then once you get clear on that, you would kind of build that out or, or uh, spotlight that as a, as a specific outcome or, or metric or goal that you'd be working towards in that initial project. Is that correct? Yeah, that's very well said. Um, okay. You and the client should agree on outcomes um, that are meaningful um, and that are obtainable. Right. So uh, and I wanna... then you're off and running. Let's go back for a moment to the ROI profitability kind of question or, or topic that, that we uh, began this uh, conversation around. Many consultants have no idea how to actually go about measuring that. Uh, they don't even think about it in, in many cases, right? All clients are equal, all projects are equal. And what we've seen in, when we've kind of taken clients through this process uh, is it's, it can be very eye-opening for them to actually see that an area of their business they didn't maybe think was that critical is their highest profitable, you know, profit area in the business. What have you found is the best way to actually go about identifying, uh, you know, which clients and which projects you should be focusing on from a profitability perspective? Like how do you actually run that exercise to identify ROI and profitability? We identify it uh, two different ways. First, if you have enough experience with different kinds of projects and different kinds of clients, then you can um, qualify at the very beginning whether you think that this is going to be worth your time. Mm. There reaches a point where you have enough experience to know things like things that affect ROI. So it's things like access to decision makers. Is this going to be a long slog for me to get approval? Or am I going to be able to to quickly get to people who can make a decision? You'll know sensitivity to price. Mm. Um, Do they have the budget to pay for what I'm going to require them to pay for the work that I'm going to be doing? You might have some inkling about reputation. Do they beat up on their consultants and make them go through dozens of iterations of work, or do they, are they easy to work with? Are they respectful of the consultant's expertise? Um, You might also have a sense of um, how they treat their um, other vendors their other providers. Um, Do they extend further opportunities to them? You can find that out even by talking to other people that they have relationships with. So at the very beginning of the process, you should go through a qualifying checklist yeah. to, to anticipate whether this may be worth your, your time and your money, your effort to pursue. Would you say in your experience that one of the maybe dangers or pitfalls that not enough people pay attention to is that they start their marketing and kind of client acquisition prospecting by casting too wide of a net, like they're just trying to go after too many people. And, and by doing so, they're not able to, to do the homework and kind of the personalization, the customization that would be required in order for the buyer on the other side to really feel that, that you get them? Or how, how do you view that in terms of being able to market to a lot of people versus it sounds like what you're really talking about here would require a fair bit of homework and you know looking around and being very considerate and thoughtful about a, about a buyer's specific situation. And that, that becomes very challenging to do when, if you're trying to automate your prospecting or you know, cast a wide net to go after a lot of people, which is what, what many consultants tend to, uh, to begin with. Yeah, you know, th- again, this is difficult for consultants to wrestle with. You can, have a, a, you can cast a very wide net um, initially for prospects, but your net has to have a very fine filter attached mm-hmm. to it. So only very few prospects will get through to the next stage. Right. Um, you have to be willing to, to, to prioritize a small number so that you have a greater chance of winning a high percentage of that small number. There's an interesting thing you'll hear from the prospects themselves about the process of selecting providers, selecting consultants, which is that they can tell who cared and who put the time and energy into it. And they can tell who did it on an automated assembly line basis. Right. Yeah. Uh, Now, depending on what you're selling, it might not matter. But if 
close relationships are important to you. And if bringing added value is important to you, then you want to be perceived as somebody who really cared, Mm -hmm. who selected that client as somebody who you, you believed you could offer high value to. Your prospects can perceive that. And I can't over, I, I just can't overstate that, the importance of that. So yes, you're much better off with a smaller number of prospects that you can apply more effort to, or in our words, you can apply more intensity to. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a, I think hopefully a great reminder for many people. This is an area that we've been focusing on with many clients because there's, there's definitely continued to be a shift. You know, if you go back several years ago, people were, were doing automation and, you know, you can still leverage automation, but it just seemed easier. But every year that goes by, there's just more noise in the marketplace. And uh, at the end of the day, to really build a long lasting relationship with somebody, it, it takes time. You, you can't send out this exact same message to to 100 different people and, and have that really connect. You might get a bite and some people are still successful with that. Uh, but really personalizing is, is an approach that we definitely uh, tend to recommend as well. I wanted to ask you, Bob, I mean, this is kind of a connected um, topic, but what do you see as, as the big difference between positioning and kind of the, you know, your, your approach and positioning when it comes to attracting new clients and keeping clients? Because you, you talk about that there is a difference in how you kind of position the firm or, or, or how you approach a new prospective client versus trying to keep an existing client and, and expand that lifetime value. Um, yeah, what, what's really interesting about um, maintaining and growing current clients, Michael, is that too many firms take it for granted that if I have a project and I do a good job, the phone will ring and they'll give me another project. Right. Um, it doesn't work out that way nearly as often as a consultancy would, would like that to be the case. Um, and it could be for any number of reasons, but none the least of which is that there's somebody out there who did not do that project, but they want that client. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is they are doing maybe the things that we recommend that they should do to attract that client. Meanwhile, you're sitting back, you finished a project, it went well, um, you got paid on time um, with some nice comments associated with it. And you're wondering why aren't they asking me for another one? So you need to treat your current clients with the idea that it's still a competition mm-hmm. um, to get the next job. Now you now need to leverage your advantage as an incumbent. You know them better. You have deeper insights into what matters to them, and you have results, which is the top, which is what we talked about earlier. You've got right. measurable outcomes yeah. that you can now put at the forefront of your a next round of communication within that client organization. That's how you'll grow your business um, by continuing to show that you care and love them and by continuing to put yourself ahead of your competition. Can you offer me a, a very, and, and everyone uh, joining us right now, a very tactical kind of approach to that. So let, let's take the example that you want a piece of business, you've done great work, the client is happy, they've told you that they are happy, uh, you may or may not know about a, about a new project or a new initiative that's coming down the line. If that's you, Bob, what, what are you doing or what would you be counseling your clients to do to develop that existing relationship to, to win more business? If you, if you could offer maybe two or three just very tactical steps that people should be taking. Right. Um, first of all, I would say care about their business way more than just the project that you worked on. What, is, what um, does that look like? Give me an example of that. Well, with that, look, look, let's let's take an example um, of an of a executive recruiter, recruitment firm, um, working with a client who had an opening. They hired you, gave you twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, whatever executive recruiters get nowadays, to go find them a um, uh, a new VP of something or other. You filled the job. They love the candidate. Now you're waiting for the next job opening to occur, and hopefully they'll call you when they need another position filled. Is that really the right strategy to just sit and wait? Some might argue, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll invite them out for lunch one day. We'll stay in touch. We know when their, their kids are uh, graduating college, we'll give them a call. That's fine too. I'm not opposed to that. What I'd rather see you do though, is take an interest in their business beyond filling that one role. 
And that I think is, is, is vital. Now take an interest in what's their business look like around this person whose job you just filled. What are some of the issues that they're facing? What are some of the pressures that this new hire is going to face in trying to grow their part of the business? What insights can you share from your other recruiting projects without giving away confidential information sure. that can make this candidate and this company smarter? Mm -hmm. Stay in, in other words, stay in touch with them, but not on a personal basis. Stay in touch with them to show your interest in their business success. Um, that information is, is available to you. You can find out how they're doing. Um, your candidate in this case would probably feed you inside information. Um, but on a regular basis, make sure that they know that you care about their business. And then they're more likely to engage with you the next time they need a position filled. Right. Um, and what, what does regular basis mean to you? Like, what have you seen is the most appropriate. I know, I know oftentimes people worry about being, you know, um, in touch too often, right. And, and bothering or, uh, just really, you know, spamming people or just like they're, they're concerned that they don't want to overstep. They don't want to, uh, to be a nuisance. What have you found is an appropriate kind of frequency to, to maintain that contact with an existing client? Um, you know, you're busy doing the work for them. Maybe that project is coming to an end regardless. What, what's that frequency that people should be thinking about that is appropriate. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with staying in touch with a client twice a month, okay. um, at least through, through marketing content or email, providing there's there that all of that content is giving them value, mm -hmm. is providing them with insights, is providing them with perspective. It's not you sending out your case studies. Right. It's not you sending out your capabilities. Mm -hmm. That is spamming them. Mm. That they would that and twice a month would even be too much of that. Right. Right. Um, as long as you're giving them items of value, I would say a cadence that's um, it, that's about twice a month, every even every two weeks, with some uh, client-centric marketing content. Follow that up with an occasional call mm -hmm. or an email with yeah. the uh, invitation to talk about issues that are currently. Um, relevant or should be relevant to that client. Say you do that once a month, you can do that in conjunction with one of those two monthly touch points. Right. Hope to get to talk to them at least once a quarter, um, if not a little bit more often. And as you have these conversations with them, Michael, you should be uncovering opportunities for you to have more conversations with them that can eventually lead to a project that right. you can take on. Your firm, uh, Artemis, works with a, a broad group of clients. I mean, we've talked about whether it's automotive manufacturers, advertising agencies, uh, accounting or professional services firms, uh, you know, a, a whole host of different types of, of industries and, and kind of client bases. Was that always the case when, when you got involved with the company uh, and when they first got started? Were they that broad or were they focused on one specific kind of type of industry or type of client to begin with? Um I don't think I ever thought of it quite that way, but that's a great question. My own background was in advertising. So the first clients that I had when I went on to this side of the, um, of the desk were agencies. Okay. Um, so that naturally was where we started. As we evolved our relationships with agencies and kind of analyzed the work that we were doing, we, we began to see its applicability to other uh, verticals. So we saw that accounting firms, for example, have to pitch or pursue business similarly to the way ad agencies do. Now, the, the nature of the solution is quite a bit different, sure. but the way they win business is very much the same. Um, and then we saw the same thing may be true for investment banks and the same thing may be true for management consultants. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it became sort of natural for us to evolve our business beyond where, where my part of it started, which was the agency world. Um, well, we Can also we were able to, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, 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 finish, I'll, I'll just finish this point, Michael, because Please. I think it's, it's important. What made our approach transferable across very diverse verticals was not because necessarily because we were experts in accounting 
or experts in management consulting, but because we developed an expertise in how buyers make decisions. Right. And what we've quickly realized was that buyers make decisions in very similar ways in highly competitive um, reviews of, of their options. And it doesn't matter whether they're reviewing an accounting firm or whether they're reviewing an engineering firm, they're still processing information similarly. So with that as the basis, the applicability of our solutions across different verticals became quite clear. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you, re you read my mind to a degree. That uh, was part of the question I was gonna ask you. So thank, thanks for doing that. I think a challenge that many people have when they're in a similar situation uh, is they can either, let's say in your case, you began with advertising agencies, rolling this out. Why did you decide to, to start to apply this to other verticals, right? So one option would be just to go deeper into advertising agencies and just be known as you know, the, the business development specialists that help you to win large bids or you know, RFPs and all kinds of stuff, just in the ad agency world. Like why not just dominate that as opposed to saying, okay, let's actually start to expand and, and do investment banks or, or do other management consulting firms or so on and so on. I'm wondering the thought process and kind of the discussion that went on with you and your team, how did you make that decision? Because I would imagine that there, it does require a bit of a shift and, and maybe some additional kind of time and resources when you're planning to think about what, what matters to investment banks or even to some of your messaging to them or updating some documents or updating content on the website. Uh, why not just do more of what was already working? And, and why did you actually decide to expand the, the verticals from a strategic decision? Um, wow, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know that it was a strongly rational decision on our part. Okay. Um, yeah. To be very honest, we, we knew ad agencies so well that we reached a point where we weren't really stimulated as much by, mm -hmm. by the next agency work. Not that we didn't like it and didn't enjoy it, um, we, we very much did, but we wanted something different. We really wanted to see what other professions were like and how applicable it is to work with their professions. I mean, I've, I've sat down with, with defense contractors and I've learned about radar systems in, in warships. I've sat down with um, IT companies and I've learned about um, different different um, software platforms. I've sat down with investment banks and I've learned about m and I mean, that, that, that to me and to the people who was working with me at the, were working with me at the time and, and even to today, it's really energizing sure. and really exciting. So I understand why some firms love to focus on a particular area um, and the value that they can bring. But on a quite a personal level, we were just energized to uh, explore other areas and learn more about different um, different types of solutions. Um, you've, but I, you've, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So you, you have had conversations that you mentioned with many different types of companies, right? Defense contractors, ad agencies, so on and so on. Uh, one area that a lot of people struggle with is how do you actually get that first meeting with with a potential buyer? if you don't have a relationship. So of course, if you can get an introduction or referral, that's hands down, right? Probably the best way to go if you don't have that relationship already. Let's, let's just play with the idea for a moment that you, you really wanna meet somebody, you have maybe five true ideal clients, just dream clients that you would love to engage with and build a relationship with, but you don't know them. And you look at you know, your LinkedIn profile or like you do sales navigator, you look at all the different potential connections and there is nobody that is directly connected to those people. How do you, what, what's the approach that you would recommend in a situation like that to actually start to, to build a relationship to, to get that first meeting when these people that you're, you know, the buyers are typically very busy. They're inundated with, with people that want their time or to pick their brain or buy them lunch or what's the approach that, that you have found uh, works best? There is an approach that works best, but I will caution you and your, your audience that it does take time and patience and perseverance. Um, but LinkedIn is a terrific tool. Um, you mentioned Sales Navigator, which is a, a great feature within LinkedIn. What we do and what we advise our clients to do is identify decision makers or influencers at those five companies that you really want to work with. 
um, send them invitations, attempt to connect with them. And as soon as they connect, begin pumping out insights and wisdom, not capabilities and case studies. Mm -hmm. But on a regular basis, they should be starting to see that the, the things of great interest and relevancy to them coming under your brand name. Even under your individual name is fine if, if you're, um, you want to get a lot of value out of LinkedIn. Continue to do that. Do that for, we usually suggest to our prospects, our clients rather, that they need to hit their prospects about six or seven times before they should even try to get a meeting mm. with them. Um, with that level of frequency, you might have some sense that they've seen your, your wisdom, they've seen your insights, they might have a sense of who you are. Then send them a note. You can use LinkedIn and their uh, message feature, asking them for a 30 minute conversation to talk about a recent insight that you sent out and how it might be applicable to their company. Don't use that um, contact point to say, I'd love 30 minutes to tell you about what we do. Right. Yeah. Um, they'll probably not respond initially. You may have to send that same message out a week later. Um, and after two or three attempts, they might not respond, but continue to pump out your wisdom to them. Um, and after two or three months, three or four months, there's a, a, a chance that you'll start to get some nibbles and somebody saying, sure, I'd love to hear about you know, more about this particular thing that you just sent me. Um, why don't we schedule some time? So Bob, you, you opened this point by saying that you, know, you, you would caution people that you're going to need to have patience and that that approach can take some time. So let's flip to the other side of the coin right? What is the preferred approach? Is it leveraging where you already have relationships in terms of getting referrals and introductions, or is there some other path that would be the kind of optimal or preferred path for people to be able to see results faster? Yeah, we, we've experimented with a lot of different ways, Michael. Um, we've even hired on behalf of Artemis, we've hired lead generation firms to do cold calling for us. We were just kind of curious. Does yeah. this stuff How actually that work? work? <laughs> uh, not very well. Yeah, as expected. Um, as expected. <laughs> good, good, good that you tried though, right? So, Well, we, we wanted to have firsthand experience with it because right. we get the question all the time. Should we try right. lead generation? Um, the, the, the best way to do it is where you started this part of the conversation, which is with referrals. Um, and, and be very, 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 very specific about who you want a referral to mm -hmm. and how you want that positioning to be done. The... Um, there, there's, a, there's a terrific book um, called No More Cold Calling, uh, written by a woman named Joanne Black. Um, it talks all about referral selling. Um, and what Joanne um, encourages, and we believe it wholeheartedly, is that, uh, Michael, if, if, if I find out through LinkedIn that you are connected with a firm that I want to talk to, mm -hmm. I will go to you and say, can you introduce me to... Um, this individual at this particular firm, here is the reason why. This is, what, this is why they might want to talk to me. And I'd give you some ammunition to do right. that. Um, and if you are in fact connected to that person or that person well, then you're now equipped to help right. make that introduction. What too many firms do that, that does not work well is um, they'll call up a contact and say, who do you know right. who could help us? Yeah. That question is too broad and too vague, and it rarely leads to anything that's going to be very effective. Um, yeah, or I, they'll I, say, we'll go through LinkedIn, Michael, and I'll notice that there's 25 people you're connected with who are working with companies I'd like to meet. And I'll say, pick and choose from the list of 25. Right. Exactly. And you give me as many introductions as possible. Um, once again, strongest way and the quickest way to get a meeting and to get business is to ask your, your network for one or two uh, introductions 
uh, but to use a broader network. Right. The more people you ask for one or two, the more likely it is that you're going to get meaningful meetings. So Bob, I have a few more questions before we, we wrap up. Uh, one is your thinking on the, the balance, even if you want to, maybe we don't even call it balance, but how you spend, spend your time or, or how you think about delivering on client projects and engagements, right? So you're in there with your clients, you're taking meetings, you're guiding them through your process, but also doing business development, right? So as a boutique firm or, or a smaller firm, if you don't have hundreds uh, or even you know, 50 uh, team members, how do you think about doing business development, generating new business and, and revenue and profit, but at the same time, having the time to actually deliver for clients. Like, what are you personally doing and, and how do you kind of counsel or, or recommend clients, again, if they're at a smaller size? Yeah, for, for smaller companies, it's, um, it's really hard, but it's essential that you have some sort of plan. Um, if you have, it, if you're in a position where you have three or four different people who are part of your firm, um, then you, sit, you, you essentially have to be able to, to say to all three or four, look, we need to spend 10 to 20% of our time over, let's say, a, a two to four week period engaged in business development activities. We want to be billable. We want to be delivering great service and satisfaction to our clients with the other 80%. But we have to be disciplined around spending 10 to 20% of our time on business development. Right. Um, and if you can do that on a regular basis, not on a daily basis, but on, on a regular basis, then you can continue some business development momentum without sacrificing service to your current clients. Hmm. Um, what too many firms wind up doing, and I know your, 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 your listeners have experience with this, is that they go all in on their client projects doing virtually no business development in the process. And two weeks later or two months later, the project's over and they're staring at an empty calendar yeah. um, and no revenue coming in. So this discipline of spending 10 to 20% of your time on biz dev um, is essential. Now, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, you, you go ahead, Bob. All right. Um, how you spend that 10 to 20% is extraordinarily important. Um, I have a, I got great advice not long ago from my own uh, marketing director who said um, every week send out 35 to 40 LinkedIn messages. Um, and if you can do it, if you can do 10 a day, which you can do at night, um, even better. So have the, the discipline and the strength and stay awake long enough so that um, even on days when you're heavily involved in client delivery, you can still get out those 10 or so LinkedIn messages. After, by the end of the week, you'll have sent out 40 or so, 50, um, and that's gonna really help. Um, you'll get some response. You can schedule some conversations, even if you have to postpone them until you're out of client work. Uh, but with that kind of regular schedule and discipline, you have a better chance of um, keeping business development going. Yeah, I completely agree. We've seen many clients over the years who become so successful that they stop marketing. Uh, and then inevitably what will happen is exactly as you said, it might be weeks or in many cases, months down the road, all of a sudden a client project stops before they expect it or just kind of you know, winds down uh, naturally as, as it should. But, uh, but they, they're not, they haven't been doing any marketing. So their whole marketing engine, right, is, is kind of getting rusty um, and they have to use so much more energy and effort to get things back up and running again. And so we always recommend, even if you just are kind of putting your foot very lightly on the pedal, just keeping that, that, that pedal down, like accelerating will, will have such a compounding effect uh, for the benefit of the business. So I really agree with you on that. If you look at the last 12 months or so, Bob, of everything that you've been doing in your firm, is there anything that you've done that has been different, something new that has had a really big impact? Could be around your pricing, could be your, your service offerings, something you've done in, in doing a proposal, just anything all come to mind that, wow, like this has really been a game changer for us or something that's had a, a bigger impact than we expected? Yeah, um, there's actually a few different things. One, the, one of the things about our company, Michael, is that we are, we are forever learning. 
we, we don't assume at any point in time that we've figured it out. So we're always experimenting. Um, a couple of things that we've landed on that we think have helped us a great deal. Um, one is, is we keep our pricing firm. Um, we, we believe that we are at the right price point that brings the right amount of value to virtually any firm that wants to engage with us in what it, whichever area of business development um, needs the needs addressing. And can, can I just ask you one question? Sorry to interrupt, Bob, but it's a clarifier. Yeah. Or to, so on, on pricing, is your pricing custom for each client and, and each project, or is it more productized where it's, you know, you have your, your kind of process you take clients through and that's set regardless of how big the client is just high level. What does your pricing kind of look like? Yeah, that it's, it's the latter. Um, okay. We, we have a, a single process that fits in it. Well, let me rephrase that. So if you imagine, and you use the term several times accurately word pursuit. So business development is a pursuit. There's different activities that take place along the way. We've okay. segmented out those different occasions or, or milestones within business development. And we have different solutions that we can offer at each of these different steps. Mm -hmm. Each solution has been, I hate to use the word productized, but I think people understand it. So each solution has been mapped out to have specific parts to it. Um, and therefore they have a specific price. So if you're a 50 person firm or a 50,000 person firm, you are going to pay that same price for that same solution. Mm. Um, and it, it's not because we, we think that a 50 person firm is equally capable of paying the price that a 50,000 person firm is, but it's because that solution has been architected to provide the same value to the small firm that it provides to the big firm. Mm. Um, so and even, as a result, even, even we don't- even if the revenue, let's say, or, or is significantly greater for the larger firm and they put it into action, would they not necessarily gain greater value? Because each project for them, let's say what for one client, it might be a million dollar win. For the other client, it might be a hundred million dollar win. So would the value be like, how do you think about, about that component of value in relation to your pricing? Um, we, we don't like to link pricing to the value of the pursuit because that's, it, well, first of all, a lot of firms don't actually know the value of the pursuit. Right. Um, pricing isn't set for them until after they win the piece of business. So how do they know? How do we know? It's just very, right. very complicated. Um, furthermore, in terms of, would a $100 million pursuit be more valuable than a $1 million pursuit? Certainly it is. It may not be more profitable. However, we like to connect the value that we're providing, not to the size of the revenue, but to the size of the profit. Mm. And depending on how you conduct your pursuit, you can make a pretty nice profit on a $150,000 pursuit right. um, or a million dollar pursuit. And that profit could be just as significant for you or more so than the profit that a big firm will make on a $10 million pursuit. Right. Okay. So you're, you're not connecting your pricing to the size of the deal that your client is, is going after, because that could be different for different sizes of companies. It sounds like you're very clear on this is what we provide as part of our program or process. We know what's involved in that. We know how much time it takes us. And uh, rather than looking at the, the deal size of your clients to kind of figure out the value that it could create for them, you're almost, it sounds like more focused on, or you're using the more of the filter of, in order to, for us to even work with a client, they need to, to meet certain criteria. And if they meet that certain criteria, we know that the value will be there if they go through our process. Is that how you're thinking about it or, or am I missing some piece there? No, you're not really missing anything there, Michael. That's, that's pretty much what we're thinking about. If, okay. if a firm is, our ideal client is a firm that wants to win more opportunities at a higher profit level mm -hmm. and at a higher revenue per opportunity. We're not specifying what that revenue number is. But if, if currently you're winning 30% of your opportunities, the average one is $150,000 in revenue and $20,000 in profit. Mm -hmm. Our solutions can take you from 30% win to a 60% win. It can take you from $150,000 value per win to $200,000 value per win. And from a $20,000 profit per win up to a $50,000 profit per win. Um, so it shouldn't matter how big you are. That 
that ought to be awfully appealing to you. Um, and certainly the, uh, the basis for which we can work together. Right. But your pricing, you, you know, you, you would not, you're, you're focusing on a certain size of company. When I say size, I just mean you're not looking at the, uh, let's say, account, accounting firms that are generating half a million dollars or a million dollars a year. You're look, you have kind of a baseline where you would begin to say, yeah, this makes sense for us to even have a conversation or, or to pr pursue ourselves, correct? Yeah, well, that, that, yes, there's no question about that, Michael. Um, we're looking for firms, for the most part, um, these are firms that, that probably generate about $10 million in revenue and up, um, and they probably pursue projects that are minimal of $150,000 um, per project. Right. Um, if, they're, if they're below either of those two thresholds, um, they're just going to have a hard time, not just on a financial basis, wrapping their minds around what we do, but even on a cultural basis, kind of thinking about the approaches that we advocate. Right. So before wrapping up, a couple of final quick questions. Um, you have a lot going on. Uh, what, what are your best kind of best practice when it comes to habits? I'm wondering, like, how, how do you maintain your focus, your level of productivity, performance, what are one or two things that you do on a daily or just regular basis that you feel really help you to make an impact and, and create success? Um, I learned, boy, I learned this the hard way um, by doing everything else wrong. Um, so here's what I do. I'm, I'm an early riser. Um, I what is, work what out. What does early mean? Give me a time. Well, between 6.30 and 7. It's not between yeah. 4.30 and 5, which is what some people think of early. Um, yeah. But 6.30 or 7. Um, and I'm usually in the gym every morning. Um, and I block out my calendars so that I don't have my first business meeting until 10 a.m. I may get to my desk by 8.30 or 9, mm -hmm. but I take the morning to clear out my emails and to get myself all set up. Um, from 10 o'clock until the end of the day, I'm either doing client delivery or I'm doing business development or I'm doing management of the company. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's I have a, a, a to-do list that I actually put into Salesforce. Um, so that's my task list. And I'm very, um, I'm pretty disciplined around getting those tasks done during that particular right. part of the day. Um, I rarely work past 6.30 or 7 p.m. at night. Um, I, sometimes I have to, but I rarely do. Um, and that means that the next morning I can start out, you know, pretty fresh. I can clear my head during the evening and I can get things done Um set myself up for the next, the next day. Nice. So um, I, I, that's to me works the best of all the different configurations I've tried. All right. And then in the last six months or so, what is one book that you've either read or listened to that could be fiction or nonfiction that you just feel you've really enjoyed and, and you'd recommend it to others? Uh, oh boy. That's a really, really tough question. Um, I really loved um, I, I do read a handful of business books. Um, I try not to overwhelm myself with business books because my, my brain tends to capture too much of it. And then suddenly right. I can't think of other stuff. Um, but a book by Dan Ariely called Predictably Irrational, mm. um, I thought was terrific. And I also, around the same time, I read uh, Dan Kahneman's book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Right. Um, and because I read him, around the same time, I sometimes have a hard time parsing out, was that Ariely or was that Kahneman who said that? Um, but both of them have made a tremendous impact on me. I've recommended them heavily uh, to people. Um, and it's because you can take their findings and extrapolate them into your business pursuits. Why did that prospect not choose me? What do they really want? Why is it that, that they make such snap judgments um, and I never seem to be able to change their mind about right, things? Yeah. Um, both of those books give you a lot of clues, a lot of insights into um, how people think and you can easily transfer that into how business people think and how decisions are made. So I strongly recommend both of them. All right. Well, Bob, I want to thank you so much for coming on here today. Uh, and before leaving, I want to make sure that people can uh, learn more about you, your work, your book. Uh, so what's the, the best place? What's the, the website address that you, you'd want to send people to so they can learn more about the book and what you're up to? Um, the company's website is uh, artemispartnership.com. 
Um, the best way to connect with me is through LinkedIn, actually. Um, it's Bob Wiesner, W-I-E-S-N-E-R. Uh, at, um, go find me on LinkedIn and uh, connect with me. Send me a message that you heard the podcast. I'm sure Michael would love to find that out as well. Um, and the book is, is called Winning is Better, The Journey to New Business Success. It is available exclusively on Amazon in paperback and in a Kindle edition. So go check that out as well. There we have it. We'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Uh, Bob, thanks so much for coming on. Michael, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun.